what shall the government do? And we look at the biblical view of the state. Most of us complain a great deal about what the government does or does not do, and rightly so in many respects. But if David Cameron came to us, like the soldiers and publicans to John the Baptist, and said, what shall we do? What would we have to answer? What would we actually say to David Cameron? This is what you should do. We need a biblical answer. Perhaps not in all the detail. Perhaps in better times for the church, there may be capable and able men who can work out the detail, but we should have some kind of answer to that question. What should the government do? First of all then, the essence of sin is the desire to be independent of God. The essence of sin is the desire to be independent of God. In the Garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5, we read, For God, this is the words of the serpent, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So there we have this temptation which occasioned the first human sin. And the temptation was to be as gods, that is, to strike out in independence of God. Don't take God's word for it, but be independent in both doctrine and in practice. Do your own thing. Do we realize that all sin is uh, encapsulated in this first human sin? And that all our sins involve disbelief of the word of God. The word of God tells us that blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And every time we sin, we are saying that that is not true. That the scriptural teaching, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee, blessed is the man that hath the God of Jacob for his help. We're saying this is not true every time we sin, because we sin under the uh, misconception that uh, our safety and our blessedness are to be found in sin and not in God, who is blessed forever, and from whom all blessedness comes for men. So every sin entails the sin of unbelief. And man has labored under the delusion of independence of God ever since. We are not independent of God, whether we acknowledge the fact or not. In him we live and move and have our being. But on the other hand, the gospel requires men to depend upon God, to depend upon God's Saviour, Jesus Christ. We must depend on him without money and without price if we are to be accepted with God. Thus you can see that there can be no faith without repentance. Because in order to depend upon Christ, we must turn from and repent of that desire to be independent of God. Trusting Christ entails saying we are not God. And we are not God of our own salvation. We are not God of anything. And depend on Jesus Christ alone. In fact, our dependence is so great that it needs nothing other than a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit to make us willing to depend on Jesus Christ. So the gospel is a message of repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is then the opposite of the desire to be independent of God. 
And uh, as we say, man is utterly dependent upon God, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. All, no man cometh unto me, except the Father which has sent me, draw him. We need to receive like precious faith from God himself. And as a sinner, man is liable to all miseries of this life, as well as the pains of hell forever. Now God perfectly judges individuals in the world to come. But in this life, he sovereignly manifests his displeasure against sin. He always underpays in this world, only in the world to come will the full wages of sin be meted out to the guilty, to the unforgiven. It is always less than a man deserves, but it is also true to say that God in this world does not deal proportionately to a man's guilt. You remember in John 9, the uh, man born blind, and the disciples said, Who had sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They got it wrong. They thought that there was some outstanding guilt attached to this man or his parents that would explain why he was born blind, whereas others weren't. You know, in Luke 13, uh, uh, the uh, tower that fell upon those of, uh, the uh, the uh, those near it, Luke 13. Uh, you remember that the Lord Jesus explains that they weren't particularly guilty. Luke chapter 13. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. For those eighteen, upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So, the what we would call the tragedy of that fall of the uh, wall and the, the tower at Siloam, or in the case of the those who were sl slain in the temple, what came about by the hand of man, whether the hand of man is involved or not, it is God who brings it about, but it is not necessarily uh, an expression of particular guilt that those who suffer most are not necessarily those who sin most. And uh, that is abundantly plain from the book of Job, for example. So we are liable to the miseries of this life which are sovereignly dispensed by God. Only in the world to come will God fully repay sin if it is not forgiven through Christ. He also judges his own institutions in their rebellion against him. He judges families. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 24. O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out thy fury, verse 25. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. He judges families, he judges nations in their rebellion against him. In the book of Amos you have that spiral of judgment as he moves nearer and nearer through the pagan nations and the judgments that are coming until he comes to Israel and then to Judah. And God judges nations. A huge section of the prophet of Isaiah is given over to God's judgment against nations to show that there is a God that judgeth in the earth. 
if nations are judged for their rebellion against God, then it necessarily follows that there is something that nations should do. Surely that's self-evident, that if they're judged for doing wrong, then nations must have a right that they should do, that they, they should do what's right. Nations as nations are duty-bound to honour God and the rulers of those nations. Secondly, there is no legitimate authority but from God. There is no legitimate authority but from God. God is the blessed and only potentate. He has absolute authority in himself. All authority exercised among men is either God-given or usurped. All authority exercised among men is either God-given or usurped. That is true in his own institutions of family, church, and state. The duty of wives to submit to their own husbands, the duty of children to honour their father and mother, the duty of church members to obey them that have the rule over them, the duty of citizens to submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake is because God has commanded it and God has placed upon those in authority a limited but real power and authority uh, to uh, govern in his name. He has given husbands and parents and elders and kings and rulers authority in their respective spheres and obliged those under that authority to submit to it. Now then, man expresses his sinful rebellion against God, not only individually, but through those institutions, so that not only do individuals rebel against God, but so do families, churches, and nations rebel against God collectively and together. Thirdly, God has appointed the Lord Jesus Christ in God has appointed the Lord Jesus Christ in whom both his salvation and his authority will be vindicated. Let me just break that down. God has ordained that the Lord Jesus Christ shall be the mediator king. His anointed, that's what Christ means, Messiah in the Old Testament and, and Christ in the New. The anointed, the one appointed by God. And God shows himself to be Jehovah in Jesus Christ. That is, the name Jehovah is associated with his saving grace and the name itself implies his self-sufficiency and his independent and absolute authority which he will vindicate in Jesus Christ. Isaiah 45, Isaiah 45 and verse 23. I have sworn by myself the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. And you know the Apostle Paul takes this up by the Spirit in Philippians chapter 2 and applies it to the Lord Jesus Christ, to Jehovah Jesus, <coughs> that God will show himself Jehovah, that he will save sinners and bring them into gracious submission to himself, and he will condemn sinners and vindicate his absolute authority in Jesus Christ. And every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And although the word Lord in Greek has various meanings, it is used there as equivalent to Jehovah. It is Jehovah who speaks in Isaiah 45 and he will show himself Jehovah, the Saviour and the Judge, in 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in John chapter 5 and verse 27, and hath, that's the Father, hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Because he is the Son of Man. That is, because he is the Messiah, God manifest in the flesh. The term the Son of Man indicates the manhood of the Lord Jesus, but it also indicates that he is the Messiah, Daniel chapter 7 Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 Daniel 7 verse 13 and I saw in the night visions and behold behold one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him so when Christ calls himself the son of man he is indirectly asserting not simply his manhood, but his messiahship. And the Pharisees knew that, but they couldn't pin it on him until he spoke of the clouds of heaven. Yes, he was speaking of the man, the son of man of Daniel chapter 7. He was claiming to be the Christ of God. And so God has appointed the second person of the Trinity manifest in the flesh to be the governor of all in the interests of his church until he shall destroy the last enemy which is death itself you have that in Revelation in chapter 4 you have the throne of God in chapter 5 you have the uh, inauguration of Christ as the executor of the father's good pleasure fulfilling the will of the Father that's expressed in the book which is written on both sides, most unusual, the full, complete purpose of God in the interests of his church, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, executes it fully because he is worthy. So then, the Lord Jesus is appointed to be the Christ of God in whom all the authority of the Godhead and all the purpose of his salvation are fulfilled. That's why he's called the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not coincidence that we have that phrase God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there are exceptions where Christ is called God but generally that's the pattern because it is in Christ that the Lordship of God, the Jehovahship of God, is to be displayed and vindicated. Now, in time, that is, in the sphere of time, he has appointed the progress of the church, the kingdom of grace, in which men are brought into willing submission to Christ through the gospel, and to desire as far as possible uh, to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's why Christians desire to express their submission to Christ in every area of life, including that of citizens. And that brings us to consider what nations should be like and what our individual duty is as not only members of the church but as citizens of a nation. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Prince of the Kings of the Earth, Revelation 1 verse 5. Nations may not legitimately declare independence of Christ. It is the duty of every man to repent and believe the gospel and submit to Christ. Therefore it is the duty of families and nations of men to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the duty of men to submit to Christ in every capacity they operate in, including civil rulers. <laughs> this brings us to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. 
In Acts chapter 4, that psalm is quoted. Acts chapter 4 and verse 24. Acts chapter 4, verse 24. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Now then, you see that in that passage, Psalm 2, part of Psalm 2 is quoted, the earlier part. In what capacity did Herod and Pontius Pilate and the rulers of Israel gather together against the Lord? Was it just as private individuals? The answer is, it was not. It wasn't just that they didn't submit individually to Christ, but in the exercise of their public office as rulers, they failed to submit to Christ. So it is the duty of David Cameron to repent and believe the gospel personally, but also to submit to Christ in his public office. In Psalm 2, when we read, come to the end of the, chap of the psalm, Rulers are told what they should do. Verse 10. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. It was in their public office that Herod and Pontius Pilate uh, fulfilled the earlier verses. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers took counsel together. And it is in their public office that kings are to kiss the son, lest he be angry but a little. In other words... This is not dealing simply with the obligation of rulers to become Christians, but for them to rule Christianly in the affairs of a nation. They are to kiss the sun. And if you want to know what that means, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10 at the anointing of Saul, 1 Samuel 10, verse 1, Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? As Samuel kissed Saul and acknowledged him to be the Lord's anointed king, so it is the duty of every ruler on earth to kiss the Son, the Lord Jesus, and to submit to his word as authoritative, not only in their personal lives, but in the exercise of their public office also. So it is the duty of rulers and nations to acknowledge the authority of Christ over the nation. Fourthly, the Lord alone can define the evil that the state is to punish. The Lord alone can define the evil that the state is to punish. Romans chapter 13, 
Romans chapter 13 and verse 4. Speaking of the ruler, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. For if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. <coughs> that administration of wrath and punishment extends to the sword, that is, the death penalty. And you remember the Apostle Paul says, If I have done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. So the power of the civil government, magistrate, extends to the death penalty. That doesn't mean that all the Old Testament penalties are automatically carried forward. You'll see that Israel was unique as church and state, and hence the language of the death penalty in Deuteronomy 13.5 is applied to excommunication in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 13. But the death penalty for murder precedes and carries on through and comes out the other side of the Mosaic uh, penal administration. <coughs> that's in Genesis 9. But that's a side step, a side issue just at the moment. But in who defines evil? Who defines evil? If he is to punish evil, well, who defines evil? Do we just go by consensus at any particular time? Or is there a fixed standard? The atheist has no business talking about right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Because if there is no one universal lawgiver, there is no fixed standard of right and wrong. <coughs> and so when the atheist uses terms like right and wrong, he is a fraud. He's borrowing from Christians. We believe that God is the only lawgiver and he defines right and wrong and no one else has the right to assert any such thing. The atheist is simply following current consensus which for some reason he merrily assumes is getting better rather than worse but he has no basis for that assumption whatever. Right and wrong belongs to those who believe there is a universal lawgiver. <coughs> now, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19, the proverb has been uh, asserted, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. On the basis of that principle, private revenge is forbidden because vengeance is the Lord's and he hasn't given that right to the individual. Mm. But a measure of that vengeance is committed to the civil ruler as the minister of God. So vengeance belongs to the Lord. He hasn't given it to the individual. He has given a measure of the right to inflict it to the civil ruler as the minister of God. And there is no such thing as neutrality. There's no such thing as neutrality. That is becoming painfully obvious. And we need to be aware of it. If you hold to the equality agenda, then the result is the, the Christians who disagree will be penalized. Of course they will. Because <coughs> the uh, equality agenda, so-called, it's not a real one, mm -hmm. but if it is applied and Christians don't agree with it, 
they are bound to fall foul of the system. Of course they will. That's why in Northern Ireland, Asher's Bakery or in Cornwall, the uh, Bulls Guest House or whatever, the, the persecution is inevitable from the so-called equality agenda. It must follow. If the man-made equality agenda is maintained, Christians will suffer. Whereas the Bible teaches that <coughs> rulers should act by upholding the law of the Lord and thus acting in the interest of the church. It follows if they uphold God's law that that will be the case. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 12 For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. Verse 16. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shalt suck the breast of kings. <coughs> and thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Saviour, and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. When the public expression of sin becomes the definition of crime, then... The, this will be favourable to the church to facilitate the church in its distinctive functions. Both tables of the law are within the scope of the civil magistrate. I'll say that one again. Both tables of the law are within the scope of the civil magistrate. This does not necessarily involve criminalizing private beliefs, but it does mean that open rebellion against any part of either table of the law of God, the Ten Commandments, is to be crime. Complete religious toleration is impossible. It does not exist. Hmm. People do things to express what they believe. The Mormon polygamist is a polygamist because of what he believes. If you're going to punish polygamy, you're going to punish Mormons who justify that polygamy. Men who sacrifice their children to Moloch are murderers, but it's for religious reasons. Are we going to excuse murder on the specious grounds of religious toleration? Also, public breach of the first four commandments, the first table of the law, is breach of the second table. The public Sabbath breaker encourages the wicked and vexes the godly. The public idolater encourages the people to sin and vexes the godly. So sin, open public sin of the first table of the law is a breach of thou shalt love thy neighbour <coughs> as thyself. So that religious neutrality does not exist. There are four views, at least, of the relationship between the church and the state. There is the Roman Catholic view. On this view, the state <coughs> is subject to Christ, but since the Pope claims to be the vicar of Christ, submission to Christ means submission to the Pope. And so when the Pope becomes theoretically head of the church, he becomes also the father of princes and the ruler of the world. He is governor of the nations, according to his claim, and he is also head of the church. So that it follows that for a, a country to be a Christian country, it must submit to the papacy. 
for a hospital to be a Christian hospital or a school to be a Christian school, it must be in submission to the papacy because the Pope is seen as the vicar of Christ. And you can't submit to Christ without submitting to his vicar, his substitute, his representative <coughs> on earth, that is, the Pope of Rome. So runs the uh, Romish doctrine. So on this view, the church governs the state. And we need to be clear on that in a day of confusion. The Pope claims to be a civil ruler. The Vatican is a state and he is not merely the head of the church. But anyway, that's the Roman Catholic view, that the state governs the church. The Erastian view is the other way around, that the church, that the state governs the church. The Romish view is the church governs the state. The Erastian view is the state governs the church. The third view is the voluntarist view, which is that the church and state have no uh, connection at all. And the fourth view is the reformed view, which is that church and state are separate, distinct, and yet both are under Christ and have obligations one to another. That was the view of our Protestant reformers. Yeah that both are under Christ. Christ is head of the church. He is the prince of the kings of the earth. The state has a duty to uphold God's law and thus facilitate the church. And the church has the duty to, to teach the state its duty. The church is to preach the whole counsel of God. So if civil rulers are prepared to listen, we teach them how the nation should be governed according to the word of God. That's why at the high point of church history in this land, you had the houses of parliament and Puritan ministers preaching to the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Could you imagine that today? <laughs> they actually had Puritan ministers who preached, and not just five-minute sermonettes, they preached to the commons and the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. And so our House of Commons and House of Lords had Puritan men and the Scottish commissioners when they were down helping at the Westminster Assembly, people like Rutherford and Gillespie and Henderson, they actually preached to the House of Commons. They were putting them in mind of their duty before God as civil rulers. How we long for such days again. How far we have fallen. Well, let's apply this. First of all, we need a goal. You might say, well, this is all so esoteric. It's, uh, it's nowhere, near, we're a thousand miles from this. But we need to have a goal if we're to know what we're to do now. If we're hazy about the duty of the state, our witness for righteousness national righteousness will be weakened. If we're squeamish about whether the state should uphold the Sabbath or should oppose idolatry, what happens when the man of sin wants to come to our shores? We need to be clear, even if it seems far from us, Find you, though it seem marvellous in our eyes, should it seem marvellous in God's eyes, he is the Lord of hosts. But even if we don't live to see it, we need to be clear 
so that we're not dithering when it comes to advocating the duty of the state. Of course we're anti-abortion because the word of God is anti-abortion and the state's duty is to rule according to the word of God. There's no neutrality. But then secondly, how we should spread the gospel and pray. We ended on this note last time. But it comes to the same thing. There are not enough Christians. Hmm. There just aren't enough Christians. Of course, if every Christian was standing up and being counted and holding forth as they ought to, it would be a lot different. Hmm. But even then, even in Northern Ireland, It isn't that different. We've all heard about the assembly vote. Okay, they block it by procedural means, but the overwhelming tide is <coughs> in favour of supposed same-sex marriage. And if the polls are to be believed, maybe they're not, but the majority of people, even in Northern Ireland, are So we are to be faithful in declaring the whole counsel of God. The psalmist says, I shall speak thy word unto kings, and they shall not be moved. We are to bear testimony, not only against the sins of society, but the sins of rulers. But still, we ought to recognize that unless the kingdom of grace advances in the hearts of men and they are brought into hearty submission to Jesus Christ through the gospel by way of repentance and faith then the change in this world is limited men are to flee to, from the wrath to come both God's wrath and temporal judgments on the nation and his everlasting wrath individuals whose sins are unforgiven. As a nation we have become a seed of evildoers and a people laden with iniquity. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? And shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? They that God himself will raise up men to preach the gospel and that God himself will spare this land and that the time to favor Zion, the church, the set time may come. That God would withhold his fury from such a wicked, covenant-breaking nation look back and we think what great days men like Rutherford and these other Puritan preachers preaching to the House of Commons from the Lords they were great days but that also illustrates how high we have been and how far we have sunk the Lord Jesus reigns in the kingdom of his power governs everything in providence and we pray for the advance of the kingdom of grace that that kingdom would advance in our hearts and that many might be brought into that kingdom and that that in due time would <coughs> express itself in a nation that is exalted in righteousness Amen, Amen.